Ignition. And liftoff. Liftoff. A Falcon Heavy with Europa Clipper. Unveiling the mysteries of an enormous ocean lurking beneath the icy crust of Jupiter's moon, Europa. Oh man, I have chills. I don't know, do you have chills? That is so cool. This is a first of its kind NASA mission. This one is dedicated to studying an ocean world outside of Earth. Sounds amazing. Welcome back, everybody. We have such a great guest coming up for you. NASA spacecraft rocketed away on Monday to Jupiter's moon, which is called Europa. They basically want to see if conditions there can sustain life, and that is a very simplified version of what they're trying to do. For more information, more details, let's bring in Sarah Elizabeth McCandless, Europa Clipper navigation engineer. Sarah Elizabeth, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be with you this morning. Yeah, we we can't wait to start talking to you. We've seen clips of you talking about this uh, on the internet, and you just have this great way of breaking this down in a very easy to understand way. So if you could, this very complex mission, explain to us what the goal here is. Sure, it's a, it's a great question because this is a really big mission. It's, it's really complicated when you get into all the nitty gritty details. But the idea is that we're trying to figure out whether or not there is another place in our solar system that could be an appropriate environment for life to exist. And so I think for a really long time, humans have wondered if we're alone in our solar system, if we're alone in the universe, is there something else out there? And we don't know. And so we've been looking for life in other places for quite a while. You know, we've been looking for evidence of past life on Mars um, for, for quite a number of years now. And the thing that's exciting about going to Europa is that it's potentially has the right environment for life right now, not billions of years ago, but right now today. So that's super exciting for oh. us. And we're really excited to get out there and start learning more about this ocean world. Yeah, so again, you're not looking for life, you're looking for the conditions. So it, it, it's not gonna stumble on something and all of a sudden everybody's gonna go, whoa, what is that? <laughs> Exactly. So this isn't quite like um, a sci-fi movie where we're looking, you know, for sea monsters at Europa <laughs> or anything like that. Um, so you're exactly right. We're okay. not looking for life directly. We're looking for evidence that the conditions for life could exist at Europa. So and so anywhere. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I'm so curious. So let's say that you do find these conditions. Then what? Yeah, so it's it's a great question. I think, you know, life as we understand it needs three things to survive. It needs water, it needs chemistry, and it needs some sort of energy. And for a really long time, I think humans had a, a narrower view of what that actually meant in terms of the kind of life it could support. And so then we started to realize that life was actually a lot more robust than we gave it, gave it credit for. And so life could actually exist in these really extreme conditions. And so we've actually found life at the bottom of the seafloor where the pressures are really intense it's really, really cold. There's no sunlight at all, but we still have found life there. And so if we find that the conditions for life could exist at Europa, I think that opens up this wealth of opportunity and this diversity of opportunity to look for life, not only in our solar system, but elsewhere in the universe. We don't have to look for planets that are just like ours to try and find evidence of life somewhere else. We can start looking at places that are maybe more hostile than we initially thought because life could still live in those more hostile environments. So that's one of the exciting things that Clipper could potentially unlock for us. Incredible. And this is not a quick trip, right? This is something that's going to take some time. 1.8 billion miles. Is that right? That is right. Yes. Billion with a B. It's a long, Jupiter's a long ways away. Space is really, really big. And so it'll take us about five and a half years to get there. Obviously, we launched this past Monday, which was super exciting, really thrilling. Um, and so now we're on a five and a half year trip out to Jupiter. We'll get there in April of 2030. Um, and then after that, we'll do some checkouts. We'll change our orbit to enter into the appropriate um, orbit about Jupiter so that we can fly past Europa and start doing all this really cool science at Europa. So what do you do for the next several years? What's your job? Or you just have a little pager and when it goes off, you just kind of go, okay, there's something going on or what are you gonna be doing day in and day out? Yeah, it's a great question. So right now, obviously, since the mission just began, we're still doing lots of different checkouts. We're making sure that all of the subsystems on the spacecraft are healthy, that the solar arrays are um, 
working the way they you know should be and and they are i want to make that very very clear the solar arrays are working beautifully uh, we just are continuing to to do additional checkouts with those solar arrays make sure that they can um, articulate essentially they can rotate um, the way that they're supposed to um, as we change our orientation relative to the sun um, so over the next several um, months and then stretching out in, into years we're continually tracking the spacecraft when i, I do a lot of outreach um, and so i always like to tell people i'm sort of a, an interplanetary maps um, app like you can't just pull out your phone and say hey how do i get to jupiter like we don't have gps <laughs> out in deep space right and so it's essentially the job of a navigation engineer to understand the data that we get back from the spacecraft and then figure out where it is and predict where it's going and that's the part that's super important um, because we don't just want to end up you know somewhere near jupiter we want to end up at the exact right point so that we can so that we can insert into the appropriate orbit about Jupiter to then fly by Europa and conduct the science. So we'll be tracking it very carefully, making sure it stays exactly where it's supposed to. And if it doesn't, we'll execute some maneuvers to kind of nudge it back on track to make sure it, it ends up where it should. I think that's one of the most fascinating parts of this is your job and, and the job that you have to plot out that trajectory and then stay, stay on it. It's just incredible. What got you into this? I mean, have you always loved space? even as a kid? I have. When, so when I was little, my parents showed me a photo called the Pillars of Creation. And it's the super iconic photo that probably everyone mm -hmm. has seen, even if they don't realize it. Um, and it was a photo that was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope back in the 90s. And then the James Webb Space Telescope actually recreated that image, I think back in 2021, um, but, but more recently, because it's obviously a newer telescope. Uh, but in the original Hubble image, it's this really iconic photo. And you see these three pillars of gas. Um, and it's a photo of a, a stellar nebula, which is essentially a, a nursery where stars are born out in, in space. And so I saw that photo and I saw that there was all of this color, there was all of this structure, there was all of this stuff out in the sky that I had never seen before from my backyard. I'm from uh, Kansas City originally, so you can actually see the uh, the stars at night, unlike Los Angeles where I am now. Um, and so I had always loved looking up at the stars and then I saw this photo and my brain just kind of exploded and realized, oh my gosh, there's all of this stuff out there in the mm -hmm. sky and I had no idea what else is potentially out there. And I told my parents I wanted to be an astronaut and I've, I've never really looked back. That is amazing. I love that, you, that you're in this field and you have such a great way of explaining all of this to make it so digestible. Uh, you have, um, I think, a little bit of a Minnesota connection, maybe a mid-range Minnesota connection, which we love. So uh, I was just Googling you and, and trying to figure out who you are. And uh, I saw that you actually have been to a really popular camp here called Camp Foley which I've also been to. So, no way. yeah. Yes, so I you have to talk a little bit about how from Atchison, Kansas, you get to uh, you know, central Minnesota and and you end up at Camp Foley and you were there for several years, is that right? I was. I think I'd have to go back and double check. I was a camper at least six years wow. up at Foley, for sure. Yeah, and my younger sister um, was a camper up there as well, so we both went. Uh, so, do you have family here or friends or how did you end up coming to Minnesota for summer camp? It, you know, it's a great question. Um, uh, my parents, honestly, probably are the better people to ask <laughs> that. Um, but I think, you know, we we wanted to go to summer camp as, as kids. Mm -hmm. I think like a lot of kids from the Midwest, you know, we were super lucky. We did swim team. We did ballet camp. We did a lot of different things growing up. Uh, but we wanted to go to to a more authentic. My sister and I always jokingly refer to it as like a, a parent trap kind yeah. of summer camp. Um, we wanted to learn how to sail, wanted to learn how to do archery, wanted to learn how to water ski. Kansas, obviously, middle of the country, I call it the heart of America, um, but obviously very landlocked. We have some lakes, but but not nearly as many as, as you guys. And so um, I think we're, we're looking around at different camps. Uh, my parents were in, in soft Foley and we um, went up. And I think the first year we went, we went for two weeks. And then every year after that, we were up there for a month or so. Uh, one of my closest friends out here in Los Angeles um, is actually from Minnesota originally. Aww. So she and I at summer camp when we were re really little. And then we sort of lost touch for about a decade. And then we reconnected out here um, a couple of years ago now. And it was like no time had passed at all. So <laughs> camp friends are forever friends. And Foley was was a phenomenal experience and one of my favorite memories of, of growing up. So that is so crazy that you went to Foley too. How I fun. Yeah, I, yeah, same. Great memories. You're right. Summer camp is just so, so special, especially that time in your life. Uh, so we are we're gonna stamp it um, and you are one of us we're gonna call you one of us is that okay <laughs> perfect perfect I'm honored to be an honorary oh, Minnesotan that's so great 
uh, I actually have our uh, one of our meteorologists here, Jared Piepenberg. I, we didn't plan on this, but because Jared's a meteorologist, I'm just very curious if, Jared, you have any questions. I do. I, yeah, do. I knew you would. <laughs> I knew you would. Okay, let's see if we can try to do this on the fly. So Jared's here. Yeah. Uh, Sarah Elizabeth, go ahead. Uh, I was just kind of curious. Um, once you reach there, you know, you know, if you find what's what you're wanting to, to look for, then what? You know, what's what's the what's the future then for for you and and uh, and space travel, I guess too. Yeah. Question. I think one of the most exciting aspects of space travel um, and, and missions like this to places that we don't know a ton about. To be clear, Europa Clipper is the first mission that is dedicated to exploring Europa, but we, we've seen Europa before. We've sent um, past missions either to Jupiter specifically or missions that have flown past Jupiter on their way to other places. So we have images of Europa today. We know a little bit about it, but obviously there's a lot more that we want to, to discover. Um, and so I think one of the cool things about going to a place that you don't know a lot about is that you don't know what you don't know. Mm. And so I can guarantee, even though I'm not a scientist, I can guarantee that when we get to Europa, we will find things we did not expect. We will see things we did not expect. And it's going to open up this whole new wealth of questions and this whole new wealth of potential science investigations. And we'll try to figure out how to answer questions that we didn't even know to ask today. And so I think that's one of the really exciting things about Clipper is that there's a lot we want to, to discover. There's a lot we want to learn. We have a great um, diversity of science instruments on board to help us answer those questions. You know, how deep is the ocean? How thick is that icy crust? Are there organic compounds in the ocean? Might there be organic compounds on the crust? What's in the, the Euro European atmosphere? Are there plumes at Europe? I could go on and on and on with all of these current science questions that we have. But once we get there, there will be a whole new set of questions that we didn't even know to ask. And so I think arriving at Europa is certainly not any sort of ending point by any stretch of the imagination. And I think it's just going to unlock a whole new wealth of discovery and a whole new wealth of science inquiry that's really, really exciting. That's so great. Yes. Uh, I have two more really super quick questions. One is when people find out that you work for NASA with NASA, how many times out of 10 do they ask you if you believe in aliens? I just need to know this. <laughs> <laughs> um, pretty frequently. Um, I get that question a fair bit. Yeah. Uh, you can allow yeah. that was my way of <laughs> asking you. I don't know so, if yeah, you if you're asking. <laughs> this is a very um, Minnesota way of asking you. <laughs> Yeah, I should, I should have picked that up. No, it's okay. Um, so I always have to make it very clear. This is my own personal opinion, right? It's not the official um, opinion of, of NASA as an agency or anything like that. But I think the universe is too big for there not to be something that's out there. Mm. Uh, you know, when we talk about looking for evidence of life, especially when I'm talking with, with kids, I always say, you know, we're not necessarily for looking like life that is, is you and me. We're not looking for people. We're not necessarily looking to find some version of a European dog or a European mm -hmm. tree, right? Uh, but even if we can find life that's as simple as bacteria, you know, mm. simple celled organisms, you know, very small multicellular organisms, that is still life. And that would still be a paradigm changing discovery. And so I think that something like that has to be somewhere in the universe because it's just too big and there's just too much weird stuff out there for there not to be um, something, you know, some form of life out there. Um, mm. We think Earth is really special and Earth is great. It's my favorite planet. Um, <laughs> but, you know, in the grand scheme of the cosmos, you know, Earth probably isn't that unique. Mm. So Wow. Well, you just made, a, I know at least a handful of people here at the station very happy because they are, they're determined to convince everyone that yes, there is, there is life. So thank you for that. Also, my last question is, uh, is your t-shirt for sale and where can we buy it? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that's a great question. I don't know. So this is a, a representation of the, the Clipper trajectory. So I'm trying to, to do this as not awkwardly it's as I possibly can. It's fantastic. Um, so this is the idea. Um, this is a representation of kind of what we'll be flying. And I guess I, I maybe wasn't explicit about this before, um, but Jupiter has a, a super intense radiation environment. And so what that means is that when Europa Clipper gets to Jupiter, it's not actually orbiting Europa. Mm. If it did that, it wouldn't last as long as we want it to because the radiation would just destroy our spacecraft. So what we're actually doing is orbiting Jupiter and we're flying past Europa every couple of weeks. Oh. And so we do that 49 different times over the span of several years and what we do with and that's sort of why you see all these different you know loops yes. kind of around so like Jupiter's here in the middle and then 
Europa, the trajectory of Europa is right here. And so then we build up all of these loops about Jupiter to build up global coverage of Europa so we can observe it, you know, on all sides at different altitudes and different lighting conditions, because all the different science instruments, you know, want to observe Europa in slightly different ways. They all work together, certainly, um, to have collaborative science to help us answer these really big questions. But each instrument individually has its own requirements. And so we have these different flybys of Europa over time to build up that coverage so we can start to answer those questions. So that was a, a sorry, a very long winded answer of saying, um, I don't know where this shirt is available for sale, but if I find that information, I am certainly happy to pass it along. Please let me know because I know a lot of us want to uh, order that. That is fantastic. We are big fans of you and appreciate you so much. Uh, thank you. And thanks for being just a role model for, you know, maybe young women who are looking to get into this field and uh, you're just, you're awesome. So we we appreciate your time today and best of luck with this. Maybe we can check in with you during the course of the next few years and just see how things are going. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm happy to, to talk NASA, Europa Clipper anytime. Awesome. So I appreciate it. And Cam Foley. <laughs> and Cam Foley. <laughs> Sarah Elizabeth McCandless, thank you so much. Good luck with everything. We'll talk to you soon.